Um, I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker and teacher for today. Uh, Levi Smith is here with us from Anchorage, Alaska at Awaken, which is one of our churches that partners with us, cheers us on, <laughs> encourages us um, as we're on this journey of planting Courageous Church. Uh, so we're so thankful that he's here. You know, long before uh, Tim and I knew where we would be planting, we knew God had given us this call, but we didn't we didn't know where yet, hadn't received the training yet. Um, Levi was already here, uh, visiting this city, praying in it, praying for the people that God would send to plant a church here. Um, he's the one that, that met us here when we went on our weekend, however long it was, trip around the city, just praying, God, is this where you're leading us? Um, and he showed us around, shared with us the things the Lord was putting on his heart for the work he wanted to do in the city, introduced us to Will and Maggie, uh, which we are so thankful for. Um, but we're just so glad that he's here this morning. Uh, this is someone that is praying for each and every one of you, uh, whether he he knows you personally or not. So, um, Levi. Levi. All right, man, this is a little bit awkward because this is a small church. Do you guys recognize that? <laughs> Probably so. Uh, the, the good thing is I'm used to it because we, well, I say we, like my wife is here. She's not here right now, but uh, we're very familiar with small church, even though at this point, you guys would probably think we're, we're pastoring a mega church or something like that in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, we planted a church there 22 years ago. And so this whole morning has been bringing back a lot of memories uh, for, for me. So, um, you know, trying to worship when it's a small group, right? I mean, if you sing, people are going to hear you. And is anybody else self-conscious, right? So, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm very self-conscious about my singing voice. I could stand up and speak in front of people all day, but if you ask me to sing something, oh, man, I turn into just something else. So I think Courageous is just a, a very apt name uh, for what you guys are trying to undertake. So you're courageously singing. I think on the last part of the song where we were singing a little louder, it sounded pretty good in here, so I think people were, were singing singing out quite well. So, yes, um, I have been praying for you guys in concept and then uh, many of you personally by name uh, for some time and enjoy doing that. I'm part of the team that's helping Coach Tim and Hannah, so all the mistakes that they are making. <laughs> yeah, that's those are probably my bad ideas, so... Uh, <laughs> Anyways, thank you for your uh, patience with them and, and uh, all of us, the whole thing. So um, I want to take a minute, first of all, to welcome those who are joining online. I don't know how many uh, guys you have participating online, but hello, wave at your computer screen or, or however you're watching and, and uh, say hello to us. Um, I want to start, though, with praying for Tim and Hannah. Did you guys know that? One of the reasons God has you here as a part of this community is to lift up Tim and Hannah, other staff folks, Ian and Michaela, uh, in prayer. Do you guys know that? That's one of your responsibilities. It's their responsibility to serve you well. It's your responsibility to lift them up in prayer. So we're just going to start with that. So if you'll join me, I'll give you a model prayer. You can just pray this for them uh, going forward every time you think about them. Okay. So uh, please bow your heads here for a moment. Father, we pray for your protection over Tim and Hannah, uh, not just their physical protection, but their spiritual protection that you would guard their faith from the enemy. Father, we ask for your blessing in their lives, that you would provide for them all the things that they need, whether it's physical or emotional, uh, whatever it is they need, Father, we pray that you would provide for them. We ask that you would increase uh, their ability, that your anointing would be upon them as you have called them to advance your good news in um, Bellevue and the greater Seattle area. 
Uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and discernment, that they would know what you are asking them to do, and that you would fill their hearts with courage to do the things you're asking them to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We are going to look at uh, Romans chapter 12. I'm used to an ear mic, so if I do this, I apologize. I'll, uh, I'll adjust as I can, but uh, we're looking at Romans chapter 12. It has a lot to do with this card right here. I notice these on the uh, seat, thinking about getting involved. Uh, you're already kind of involved here just by being a warm body, which is very important in a church planning situation, right? I mean, just being another person in the room, it, it adds, we're like, you know, we're people that like to herd together, generally speaking, and we feel more confident and comfortable when there's lots of other people around. So just being here, being present is a big deal. So uh, one of the ways you can serve is by attending, by participating, which you guys are obviously doing. You get like an A++ on that first one, okay? So uh, Romans 12 is a really practical um, passage of scripture for us where the Apostle Paul is giving us some, some very specific things to do in response to the gospel. Uh, so the gospel, if you're not aware of what that is, uh, that's basically saying God is real. God desires fellowship with us. God allows us to be autonomous in order to gain that fellowship somewhere along the line. We've screwed that up and messed up fellowship. And then God has sent Jesus in order to invite us back into fellowship and to provide a way of reconciliation. And so we are here celebrating the fact that God has invited us back, has provided a, a way back. We've, we've recognized okay, I don't like being out of fellowship. I don't like, you know, figuring things out on my own. Uh, I, I'm, I've come to the conclusion that God does have the best way forward. And so I want to return to fellowship and I can through Christ. And so that's the gospel. So Romans 12 is, you know, obviously 12 chapters in. Uh, but Paul has spent the, the first majority of Romans explaining what the gospel is, what I just explained to you. And then in Romans 12, he gets to this part where he's saying, okay, okay this is how you respond. This is what you do. Uh, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. I don't know if that's what you guys have up here. Okay, all right. So in the NIV, okay, in the NIV, which is another English translation, it's, it starts with, in view of God's mercy, You'll see that here, but in a, a different phrase, but in view of God's mercy. So Paul is saying, in, in light of everything that we've been talking about here, these are the ways to respond. And they're certainly very applicable to uh, a small church, a beginning church situation, okay? Applicable to our faith, regardless of where we are, uh, but applicable to this setting right here. Starting in verse one. And so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Right. That's in view of God's mercy. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind you will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. All right, well, I'm going to stop a couple times as we're going through, so good luck following me. Um, okay, so the first response that, that Paul is saying that we should have is a response of surrender. Right, which is everybody's favorite activity, right? I mean, I'm sure you get up in the morning, you call your friends and you say, hey, after work, uh, let's get together and just surrender because it's such a fun activity. You know, I, I love just surrendering. And so it's, you know, it's not something that we do easily. It's something that we, it, it takes a lot of serious thought. It takes a lot of, uh, actually a lot of grit 
to surrender, a lot of laying down of pride, which is probably the most difficult thing for a human being to do, is to lay down their pride and surrender. So the first thing is surrender. You know, it's, it's okay to surrender if there are some things in place, right? If uh, the, the one you are surrendering to, for example, has perfect character. It doesn't make sense to surrender to uh, some evil, some selfish, some, and we could keep going down the, the list, but it does actually make sense to surrender to God because not only is he all powerful and <laughs> there's kind of going to be a surrender situation one way or the other at some point, but he is for us, right? He is all for us. He is committed to using all of his power on our behalf. So that's what we call a good surrender, a really good surrender. I mean, it is wise. It is good for us to surrender in this situation, but it doesn't take away the fact that it's difficult to do. But that's the first step. And I'm thinking that uh, quite a few of you here have made that decision to surrender yourselves. And so Paul goes on to describe what happens and then, you know, what that looks like in very practical ways in our lives. The first thing that happens is God starts to reorient our minds, right? He transforms us by helping us to think in different ways, right? That's where the spiritual battle is. That's if you, if you've ever wondered what it's, what it means to walk in the spirit. You can look at uh, Romans chapter eight, starting in verse six, right? It's, it's thinking about the things that the spirit would have us think about. That's what it means to walk by the spirit. It's, it's this issue of where our mind is focused, right? Okay. So the first thing is surrender and our, our thinking begins to be transformed. Verse three, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. So, the reason that you guys are sitting here is because at some point, Tim and Hannah surrendered their lives to Christ and have made a decision to continue to surrender their lives to Christ. They could be doing lots of other things. And then those who have joined around them in leadership, uh, Will and Maggie, Ian, Michaela, and I'm, I'm not sure who else is in the, the core here of, in terms of like kind of carrying the weight of the church, but those people have surrendered themselves to Christ. They've surrendered their lives, right? And so these things start to manifest themselves in a good work. So there's this thing of uh, not considering yourself. Um, don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. So this is really important um, for our lives generally. It's really important in a church planting situation, right? I mean, you're, you're, kind, of, you're kind of being hum, humbled in a way, right? Because it's, it's, it's difficult to start out uh, with not all the lights and the smoke and the, and the whatever you might want programming-wise. Just like, you know, when you think about a church fully developed, there are all of these things, right? And over time... Uh, things will develop here, no doubt, right? But there's this place where, this place of humility that you're called to be in, right? And then you'll, you'll find as you grow and develop, God keeps calling you back to that place of humility, right? Because there are new challenges, there are new efforts, there are new things to try to tackle, and it requires humility. Always, at every step along the way, it requires humility. So, how are we doing on humility? Paul goes on and uh, explains that we belong to each other, which is disturbing to me. Does that disturb you? 
I belong to you and you belong to me, right? Uh, in the United States, we are very individualistic in a culture, or at least we like to think that, right? I mean, everything is about uh, being custom tailored to the individual needs, right? And to the individual personalities. And like, you know, we don't necessarily love wearing the, even the same colors of other people. Like if somebody else is wearing the same shirt of us, shirt as us, it just probably ruins our day, you know? Uh, we're, we like this idea of being very individualistic. And here Paul comes along and says, hey, guess what? You don't even belong to yourself. You belong to the body. And everybody else in the body, they belong to you. You're, you're, you're part of something bigger than yourself. Right? So critical in this situation, right? It's, it's hard in smaller churches for somebody to come in and be uh, anonymous, right? Like nobody's going to come into this size gathering and be anonymous. Maybe when you have, let's say, 50 adults in the room, maybe somebody could sneak in for a moment and be anonymous. Until that point, certainly. And that's actually one of the, you know, it's easy to think about small churches as having all these disadvantages. One of the great advantages is you can't be anonymous here. It's actually a deep desire in us to be known, to be fully known by other people. I mean, that's the secret sauce that you have right now. And that's the secret sauce that larger churches, they're fighting to maintain, to keep, to regain, is because people will leave if they are not fully known, right? I mean, they might come in thinking they want to be anonymous, but the reality is they don't want to be anonymous. They want someone to pursue them and care about them and love them, right? Now I got, I got lost in where I was. Oh yeah. Uh, we're all a part of the body, right? I belong to you. Uh, that's going to mean that from time to time you do some uncomfortable things on behalf of other people. I was reminded uh, as I came in here and saw the communion elements of uh, one of the situations where uh, I have been called upon to serve in a way that was very, very uncomfortable for me. How many of you like floaties in your drink? <laughs> Nobody's raising their hand. Probably not even online. There's probably nobody out there who likes little floaties in their drink, okay? So this story has something to do with that. It's, um, it's a little bit gross. Uh, we were serving communion at our church one Sunday. And we, at that point, we were doing the thing where you pass trays around and there were these little cups and then you'd pass, or yeah, you'd have a, there was one tray with the bread on it and then another tray would follow with the little cups, you know, these golden things. If you grew up in church, maybe you've seen these things I'm talking about. We were growing, and the number of communion elements that we had put together was not enough. We were one short. And guess who always gets the communion elements last? The pastor does, right? Everybody else is served. The pastor goes over and grabs the last elements. At least that was our tradition. Well, I go over, and I see that the tray is empty. And so I have no choice but to walk the church through the elements of communion uh, without having the elements in my hands, which is a little bit weird, right? But I'm, I'm walking uh, the church through this, and I ask people to go ahead and take the bread. They take it together, and then we get to the, the, the cup, and somebody sitting on the front row, his name was Michael, uh, who was... Uh, a person who I had had three previous conversations with about personal hygiene. There's a lot of backstory there we won't go into, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that gives you some taste <laughs> of the situation. <clears throat> Incredible heart that Michael has. He sees that I do not have the elements of communion. So after I encourage the congregation to take the cup of communion, he saves half of his glass for me. And he walks forward, 
in front of a full house, right? It's a full house because we didn't have enough elements of communion. And he says, Pastor, it's wrong for you not to take communion with us. I look in the cup, and there is a floaty, right? Some of the communion bread. I mean, it's, it turned out to be very efficient, but <laughs> <laughs> there I am in front of all these people, uh, and what do I do? Because I belong to him, because I belong to the body, I do something that is, you know, a worst nightmare situation for me. <laughs> Growing up, if my brothers touched my glass, it didn't matter how good the drink was, I was done. I was out. There's no way that I'm going to drink it after they touched it. Certainly if they touched it with their lips, for sure I am out, right? I took the cup and I drank the cup. Because I belong to the body of Christ. And this was pre-COVID, by the way. Maybe during COVID I would have had an excuse, you know? <laughs> And the body belongs to me. So I'm guessing you're going to be challenged in a lot of ways going forward to be part of the body, right? Uh, you know, to do this thing. And when you step in, I got to warn you, when you step in a little bit and start serving, somebody's going to recognize your gifts, a way in which God has shaped you, and they're going to call you to do more. They're going to call you to give more. Not that they want to just see you totally exhausted in life. Not that they're trying to manipulate you in some way to, to have your life absolutely dominated by doing service projects or something like that. But people are going to see things in you and they're going to call you to do, to do more, to give more of yourself. Because it's the best way to live, and they know that that's the best way for you to live. Because as they're using their gifts, and as they're being obedient in their lives, they are seeing God do a work in them and transform them in a way that they are loving. And they want that for you. I think, I'm at verse 6. In this, <clears throat> excuse me, in his grace, God has given us Different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Right? So... Each of us have been created uniquely. <laughs> Shouldn't take us too long to figure that out. About a five-minute conversation probably gives you some indication about how you are uniquely created and how the person you're talking to is uniquely created. God has a purpose in that. There is a reason for that, right? And so within the church, we get this opportunity to kind of figure that out. And one of the great things about not being anonymous is that people around you can say, guess what? You are really good at encouraging people. Uh, there's a gentleman in our church that this is his gift. It's the gift of encouragement, which is different from, um, hey, pastor, that was a really good sermon. Thanks. Right? Um, people are awkward, and they don't know what else to say, and so they just say, oh, good sermon. Uh, this is you should you should say a good sermon. I'm not I don't want to take that away, but uh, this is going far beyond that and being getting incredibly authentic, being super thoughtful, and just kind of you know it's, his name is Steve. Whenever I have a conversation with Steve, it's like I need to prepare my heart because I know something really heavy is coming, but I know it's going to be good. And I know this is not going to be a light conversation. This is going to be a very serious but seriously good conversation. And I know at the end of it, I'm going to have received something legitimate, something very authentic, something very useful to me. 
something that's going to breathe life into me. This is somebody who has the gift of encouragement, okay? So there are a number of other gifts here. Uh, we can talk about the, the gift of giving. <laughs> um, this is not talking about tithe. Uh, this is the gift of generosity, right? And so uh, this is a very small group. And so w- did we just enter into awkward? Do you guys talk about money a lot around here? We don't, we've rarely talk about it at, at our church, Awaken Church in Anchorage. We don't pass offering plates. I noticed you guys didn't do an offering plate. Uh, you probably have some way to give. I'm assuming you can give online. I'm assuming maybe there's a box. I don't know. I don't know what the rules are here. But obviously, money is an important thing for churches to operate. And what does Jesus tell us? He says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also, right? And so uh, this is an opportunity for you to test where your heart is, right? I mean, there's, there are only a few ways in which we're actually able to know what our real motives are. And this is one of the ways for us to know what our real motives are, right? To, to, to test our own faith. Where, where is my heart on this? And so, uh, you know, super critical for you guys to, to think about giving on a regular basis to the church, tithing, if you're not familiar with that term. So if you're, if you're not comfortable with that, I mean, <laughs> if somebody walks up to you on the street and says, hey, how do you feel about just giving 10% of your income to an organization that uh, you know is is uh, doing good things in the community. Ten percent of your income—that's a lot. Ten uh, percent. This idea of ten percent, by the way, is like an Old Testament concept. In the New Testament, it's it's actually much more. So we don't want to talk about that. This is really uncomfortable, really uncomfortable in the, in the New Testament, right? I mean, people are, are, get, are they're giving dramatically. And so, um, you know, 10% is just kind of like this baseline. So here are some practical things to think about. One is pray for God to bless you financially, right? It's, it's actually a promise in Scripture, and I'm, this isn't like a health and wealth gospel that I'm presenting here, but it, there's a promise in Scripture that if we will honor God with our finances, that he will honor us in our financial picture. So I'm not saying you're going to get wealthy overnight if you begin giving 10% to the church. I'm not saying that. I am saying that God's promise is that if you sow generously, you will reap generously. This is a, a promise from God very clearly laid out in Scripture. So it's okay to just pray for God to bless you financially, right? It's okay to pray for promotions, for raises, for God to, you know, expand your territory. God, God does desire to bless us. Do you know that? That is the desire of his heart. I mean, this whole thing is set up for fellowship, that he could fellowship with us, which is the most incredible blessing. Like that is God's desire to pour out on us. I mean, think about a parent that loves their child, right? I mean, Jesus even uses this analogy. He says, if your child asks for a fish, I think, you don't give him a snake, right? And we're asking our Heavenly Father for good things, and our Heavenly Father wants to pour out good things. So ask for good things and expect good things, but know that to the person who is given much, much will be required. God expects us actually to respond to the grace that He's given us in our lives. He expects a response from us. Uh, We could go through the different gifts. Leadership is important, right? Uh, How long have I gone? I don't know. Normally I have a clock to look at. Does anybody know? Oh, and we started at nine. Okay. I'm going to start at 10. Uh, That's what I meant to say, 10. (laughs) Okay, I see. Okay. Don't say that. Never tell a pastor that. That is... (laughs) That is not wise. That is definitely not wise. 
Okay, verse 9, I think, is the most challenging, for me, the most challenging uh, verse in Scripture. Because I am a professional pastor. I get paid to be a pastor. And one of the qualifications of a pastor is that you have to love people. If you don't love people as a pastor, whew, you are really in the, long, the, the wrong line of work, right? So what can happen in a pastor's heart or in a Christian leader's heart uh, is that at some point you can move from really loving people to pretending to love people. Because if you pre- even if you pretend to love people well, people will love you back. They will follow you. They will hang out with you. They will want to be a part of the community that you are establishing, right? So it says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. But I don't think this is just an issue for pastors and Christian leaders. I think this is an issue for Christians who have been Christians for a while. I think it's very easy to uh, uh, do the lip service thing, right? I'm blanking out right now. I think it's James who says, you know, if you have a brother or sister in need, maybe it's John who says, if you have a brother and sister in need and you don't meet their need, there's no love in you. Something along those lines, right? Um, You know, there's this thing where we can say, Hey, I'll be praying for you about that. That sounds like a really tough thing you're going through, right? As are there any Christians in the room who have said, Hey, I'll pray for you. And, and the reality is what you're saying is, uh, good luck. Good luck. Uh, see you later. I hope, I sure hope God helps you with that. Because I'm sure not going to be able to. Right? Uh, I do that as a pastor sometimes, right? I mean, there are some, sometimes, like, I've got too much going on. I've reached my capacity. Um, For whatever reason, I leave it at that. Right? Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. That means setting aside your life. And how many of you have an important life? <laughs> My life is super important. It is super important to me, right? And if you, if you ask me to, to change things up in my life, if you're going to ask me to inconvenience myself, that's a big ask. That is a big ask. For example, I hate meetings, which is a very bad for a pastor. <laughs> it's very bad. But I hate meetings. And so when, whenever somebody says, Pastor, I'd like to meet with you, that is, that is a horrible moment in my life, right? <laughs> it's a horrible moment. Because that means that I have to not be productive. I am task-oriented, actually, and not people-oriented. I, I act people-oriented around people, but I'm actually task-oriented. My, when somebody asks me how your week w- went, I immediately think, how productive was I? Like, how many tasks did I get done? I don't think about my relationships or good conversations or anything like that. It goes right to task. So when you ask me to have a meeting, Horrible. Because I'm going to have to inconvenience myself. I'm going to have to get outside of my comfort productivity zone. And I'm going to have to show compassion, which is another area of weakness for me. Right? I'm going to have to show compassion for this person. The absolute worst nightmare, worst nightmare is if somebody says, I would like to meet with you monthly. <laughs> uh, sorry, there is one worse. I'd like to meet with you weekly. Horrible, absolutely horrible. So I do this, though. I do this with people because I belong to the body. And because I'm trying to not just pretend to love people, but actually love them, to actually step into their life, to actually forget about all the very, very important things in my life and 
put somebody else's interest above my own, right? I'm going to stop there going through Romans, but there it continues to be uh, very challenging in terms of being a real Christian, being authentic about who we are, you know, like never getting tired of being hospitable. Do you love people in your space? If you do, you're weird, right? I mean, being a host is difficult past about an hour, right? Once it gets past about an hour, it's like, okay, I wonder how long they're going to stay. You're probably a lot nicer than me, and that's very good. You should be nicer than me. Uh, on your own, if you like, continue reading through uh, Romans 12. But I want to transition to Zechariah, which is weird. Zechariah um, is a prophet during the time when, uh, you know, after the exile, if you know your Old Testament history very much, you know, Israel's basically destroyed. Everybody has to leave the country and go to Babylon. Not everybody, but most people. The temple is destroyed, which was like their pride and joy. It was everything to them, right? And it was destroyed by the Babylonians. At some point, God ushers them back in to the area of Israel. He reestablishes them in Jerusalem through a number of miracles. And they are in this place where God has, has called them to rebuild the temple. Okay, so this is a, a big moment. The problem is they are very low on funds. You see, the last temple was built by Solomon, who arguably in history was the wealthiest person ever to live. Right? Like you can compare him to all the kings and rulers who have ever, you know, maybe Augustus Caesar, but Solomon was way up there, top five at least, okay? So incredibly well-funded, uh, had a massive slave labor force, okay? So every resource you could desire, Paul, or Solomon had it to build the first temple. Not the case with these folks. They uh, were underskilled. They were underfunded. They were... Uh, few in number. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like a church plant to me. It sounds like a, a, a beginning church. So Zechariah has this vision. God gives Zechariah these a number of visions in order to encourage uh, the people of Israel, the remnant that has returned, this small group of people. And there's a, a verse, Zechariah 4 and verse 10. Uh, in order to, I should say one more thing in order to understand the verse. Zerubbabel was like their governor, like their political leader, sort of like the, the mini king, okay? Uh, so you'll see his name in here. Um, I'm going to back up to verse 9 so you don't have this. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple and he will complete it. So they're, they're a little ways through the process. It's not going well in this moment. And he will complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of heaven's armies has sent me. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand, which is like a level, you know. Do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Can you imagine God rejoicing? Now that would be quite a worship service uh, to have the object of worship leading the song, leading in joy, providing the energy, giving the thrust, providing the passion, right? There are very few instances in scripture where it says that God himself rejoices. This is one of them. Another one is when somebody who has been far from God repents and returns to him. 
when somebody who has been falling away from God or who somebody who first discovers God, when they decide to accept his invitation to be reconciled to him. That's the other time where God says there will be rejoicing in heaven, right? The angelic (laughs) choir lets off and things go crazy. There is a party in heaven when somebody figures it out, when somebody receives the invitation, when somebody says, yes, I'm in. And this other time is when the work begins. God rejoices because God is able to see the completion of the work, right? God knows what's going to happen 20 years from now as a result of you guys being faithfully in this room and faithfully inviting your friends and faithfully serving in different ways that God is calling you to serve. I don't know if you know the story of Adoniram Judson. You said I could go on and on, right? Uh, Yeah. Adoniram Judson was a Baptist uh, missionary to uh, the country of Burma in 1812. And uh, he was a spiritual giant, this guy. I mean, he, he was just massively passionate for Christ. His prayer life would just blow us away. His knowledge of scripture, it, it, I mean, a, a giant. He goes to Burma and he begins sharing the gospel and there's no fruit. He sends a letter home each month to report back to headquarters. And he reports in his letter, there's no fruit. There's no fruit. And he does this month after month. He does this year after year for six years. I mean, this guy is translating the Bible into the Burmese language. He is is a brain on wheels. And he is passionate about Christ. He actually loves people. He does, he's not just pretending. He's loving people. And for six years, there's not a single convert, not even one, until finally somebody walks in and just says to him, I'm ready to become a follower of Jesus. Uh, Forty years later, there are 200, by the time he dies, there are 211,000 Christians in Burma. Today, so there's been a few years, but there are over 5 million Christians in Burma, largely as a result of Adoniram Judson's work. So God rejoices when the work begins because he knows what's going to be happening down the road. He knows that Zerubbabel is going to complete the building of the temple. Even though there are struggles, there are difficulties, there's, you know, not enough funds, not enough people, not enough skill. God sees the completed work, right? And he sees the completed work in us. That's how he views us, right? He sees us through the lens of Jesus, the completed work. And so that's why God rejoices when we return to him, because he sees the completed work. His guarantee for us is that he will make us holy. He will make us righteous. He will perfect us. He sees the completed work. So if you'll join me in prayer. Father, I pray for Tim and Hannah and uh, the leaders here. I just pray now for uh, the church, the assembly, the congregation. I ask, Lord, that you would put it on their hearts to pour themselves out, to to exhaust themselves on behalf of your church and the work that you've called them to, to understand how you've gifted them, that they would not take it lightly, but they they would know your purpose for them and that they would step into it and they would give themselves fully in every way. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.